Now, I have mixed feelings about these principles. They make sense if the changes that appear in the text were made on purpose. On the other hand, my guess is that most changes that happened, at least the ones before the year 300, were in there by accident. In which case, all four of those principles would be just the opposite. If the mistakes were made by accident rather than changes that were made on purpose, well then the more polished is more apt to be correct, that someone made a mistake and ended up making it less polished, that originally they harmonized, but because somebody miscopied something, now they don't. No one is going to accidentally add something to a text, but they might accidentally leave it out, skip a line when they were copying. And again, no one is going to accidentally make a difficult passage into one that reads smoothly, but they might accidentally copy a passage that reads smoothly, and because they leave out a word or two, they make it more difficult. So to me, it's a toss-up. It all depends upon your underlying assumptions. And that's why I believe we can't just simply throw out the Western text and the Byzantine text and say, okay, the Alexandrine text is it, which even the scholars don't. Like I say, they, they look at all of them and they go with that principle. But I think if we want to be spiritually and intellectually honest, we have to acknowledge that it's extremely unlikely that the original autographs read just like the Byzantine text. If so, there would be some quotations from the early Christian writers that fit it where it differs from the other. But as I said, it's the other way around. Where it differs from either the Western or the Alexandrine, there are no early Christian quotations that match it. So I do think that the critics are correct in saying that the Byzantine text is in itself somewhat of a critical text, that they were looking at the Western and the Alexandrine and the Caesarean one, if in fact there was a separate Caesarean family, and then trying to harmonize them and again conflating them if something is in the Western but not in the Alexandrine, they would add it. If something was in the Alexandrine, not in the Western, they would add it. If something was unpolished in, say, the Western but polished in the Alexandrine, then they would go with the Alexandrine or vice versa. So I think what we do have in the Byzantine text is the first critical text, but based on entirely different principles. And I think just on that basis, it has considerable merit. Because we can be quite certain when we read the Byzantine text that nothing has been left out. That everything the Western Christians were reading and everything the Alexandrine or Eastern Christians were reading is there in the text. We aren't missing anything. On the other hand, it may be fuller than what the original was, and it may read a little bit more smoothly than the original. But we do have a text that I think has considerable merit on that basis. Now, where the King James translation differs from the Byzantine text and from the others, then again, if we're really interested in truth, instead of just upholding a position that we grew up with, if we're really seeking after truth, then I think the only honest position is to say we cannot support the King James where it differs even from the Byzantine text, let alone from the Western and the Alexandrine. Before we go any further, there is one thing I do want to clarify. I've been speaking a lot about the differences between the Byzantine text and the Alexandrian text, or the critical text. And this might give the impression that there is this huge difference between these text families. But that would be a very wrong impression. Did you know that actually 85% of the time, the Byzantine text and the Alexandrian text read exactly the same. And for the remaining 15% where there are differences, most of these differences are extremely minor. If it was any other book than the Bible, no one would even take notice of most of these differences. They're that insignificant. The second point I want to make sure that you understand is that whatever camp 
people happen to be in, they're basing their views on assumptions. As we've already mentioned, the critical text camp are assuming that changes in the New Testament text were made intentionally in order to make the reading smoother or to clarify a doctrinal issue or something like that. But as I mentioned before, it's just as likely that changes came into the, the text because of errors. They were unintentional. And if that's the case, then it throws out so many of the basic assumptions of textual criticism that are used today. Also, the critical text camp are assuming that the state church worked to produce a uniform Greek text throughout the Greek-speaking church, and that that is the origin of the Byzantine text and why the majority of the manuscripts, even though they're later ones, follow the Byzantine text. And that may be true. It's a reasonable inference. But there's no specific historical evidence that this actually happened. It's an assumption. Now, similarly, the King James people, the people in the Byzantine text or majority text camp, make their assumptions as well. They assume that from the very beginning, the Greek manuscripts read just like the Byzantine text family reads today. And yet they can't produce any manuscripts of this type earlier than the 9th century. What they say is, well, all of the earlier ones got worn out because they were constantly being used. Well, that's not an unreasonable assumption, but it is an assumption. There's no specific evidence to support that. So what I'm saying is that there's really no grounds for either camp to get on their high horses and begin denigrating the other camp or accusing them of either being ignorant or being heretics out to destroy Christianity. And there is certainly no historical evidence of some kind of satanic conspiracy at work here like a lot of the popular tracts and books want to portray. As I said earlier, most of the significant variations between the Western and Alexandrian text types were around before the year 200. And some of the Orthodox early Christian writers quote from one text family and other Orthodox early Christian writers quote from another text family. So where's the conspiracy? Where's there any evidence that Satan was at work here? There simply is none. Now, up until now, I've been speaking about the Byzantine or majority text family, and I've actually said very little about the Textus Receptus itself. Now, some of the advocates of the Textus Receptus, which is the Greek text from which the King James Version was translated, make all kinds of fanciful claims about the Textus Receptus. For example, one pamphlet I've read claims that Constantine brought about the corruption of the Greek text, and that the faithful Christians who wouldn't go along with Constantine hid out in the mountains and hills, and they preserved the original New Testament text known as the Textus Receptus. And then this Textus Receptus eventually passed down to the Waldensians who produced a Bible from it. And then the Reformers used this old original text for their translations. Well, that makes a nice story, but it's hardly the truth. The Waldensians did produce their own Bible translation, but it was a translation of the Latin Vulgate. They didn't translate it from Greek, they translated it from Latin. Now, centuries after the beginning of the Waldensians, the reformers in Geneva, Switzerland, not happy with the Bible that the Waldensians were using, made a new translation for them that would have been from the same text type, the Textus Receptus, that all of the Reformation era Bibles were based on. But this was a new translation made in the 1500s. It's not what the Waldensians had been using before that time. Actually, we know the exact origin of the Textus Receptus. It's the Greek text that was compiled by Erasmus in the early 16th century. Erasmus, as you no doubt know, was a Roman Catholic scholar and a Christian humanist. 
He was truly one of the most brilliant men of his day. But he produced his Greek text rather hurriedly, and he had only a few manuscripts to work with when he produced his Greek text. He had nothing like the thousands of manuscripts that are available to textual scholars today. In fact, Erasmus originally couldn't find any manuscript that contained the entire Greek New Testament. Therefore, he had to piece together several different manuscripts. He primarily relied upon two Greek manuscripts that date from the 12th century. So these weren't ancient texts at all. They were medieval texts. But those two manuscripts didn't read exactly alike, so Erasmus had to choose which rendering to go with. However, he had only one manuscript for the book of Revelation, and it was missing.